My friend David Hall, to whom I've already referred once, has this terrible way of just making throwaway remarks which stick in one's mind. And while I was doing work on Watertown, he, he was very kindly driving me uh, down Mass Ave past the Common, and we went past the statue of John Bridge on the Common, and um, I, I said, you know, oh, it's still there. Um, and he said, it's amazing, really, I think, that nobody's written a... Uh, history of 17th century Cambridge since um, old page and that was 1877 hmm strange he said <laughs> and um, that was it that got me going <laughs> but anyway it is a simple it's one of the treasures of Cambridge the historic commission uh, it's got a wonderful library it's got a magnificent staff um, under Charles and uh, the thing that he pointed out, another of these throwaway remarks, you've seen the Nylander papers, I presume, he said one day, as I was just about finishing it. And he pulled out these papers, uh, a series of files that have been combined, combined by a man called Robert Nylander, who uh, had made maps of or every section of Cambridge in the 17th century. Just amazing work. And um, it really transformed my sense of what Cambridge was like. I always have great difficulty in uh, trying to imagine the space of these 17th century towns, especially when the burying ground is now opposite a gas station. But um, it, 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 that is the most difficult thing for me to do, this, to get a sense of the space. And these Nylander maps, which Charles put me onto, were, were just, just marvellous. One of the cases in uh, Cambridge cameos, again fairly near the beginning, is the famous witchcraft case um, which occurred, I think, in the late 1650s uh, in which uh, two women, mother and daughter, called Holman, were accused by a family uh, called Gibson of bewitching uh, their daughter and their daughter's children. And it is a, a truly horrifying case. The screams of the victims were, held, were heard across Cambridge Common, which is larger, much larger in the 17th century than it is now, in the town. Those must have been some screams. But they lived, I, from the Nylander maps I discovered, they lived just opposite each other, up on Garden Street and Linnean Street, and, um, you know, I, I walked up there and I just stood there and got a sense of, even with modern housing and so on, uh, what, what that part of, that corner of Cambridge would have been like and how far it was from the rest of the town. So I'm very grateful, very grateful indeed. Well, the first thing I found about Watertown was that it was a fiercely independent community. Uh, it was, uh, for instance, it was, as I'm sure most of you know, the town which protested when the uh, Court of Assistance in 1632 sought to impose a tax on all the towns of Massachusetts. Um, they were eventually forced to apologize but uh, they won uh, the real victory, which was the creation of the, uh, co the, uh, the um, Court of Deputies, the lower house uh, of the Massachusetts uh, Central Administration, which was set up in 1634, with deputies being elected by uh, each town. So th they, they um, were very early on political protest. Uh, they were uh, very early on religious protests as well. This was partly uh, in the fact that in 1630 the um, tra tradition had already uh, appeared that when churches were created, other 
uh, churches should send representatives over and should help in the ordination of the minister of the new church. Watertown would have none of that and they did it themselves and they didn't want anybody there uh, and uh, they were an independent congregation so this sense of independence is not just political it's religious as well also another thing that had changed and may have led to the decline of conflict was that people began moving out of the two little centers that had been formed uh, and they were described as living scatteringly so they, they, were, they were moving away from the centres and therefore uh, reducing the amount of conflict that was likely to happen between neighbours so uh, uh, there they were up the creek living scatteringly uh, sometimes in conflict and yet and yet they stuck together they were divided but they stood and uh, this was the interesting thing that I addressed in the last part of the book which I don't have much it's a complicated story but why it was that they, they stayed together uh, partly it was because um, although they might dislike each other they came to hate other people even more in some <laughs> cases <laughs> they were a pretty ornery bunch um, and um, it also, uh, I think, uh, towards the 1660s and 1670s, as the threat of Native Americans rose, sticking together was, was the, the, uh, uh, the right kind of decision to make at that point. So that is the early history of Watertown. Uh, it's mainly written as a fairly conventional town history, um, with um, sections on various areas and going through periods of time. At the end, however, there are about ten case studies, and um, I did. I was planning to read you one of them, but you'll have to uh, read it to yourselves because my time is now up. But there are some very interesting cases that I've uh, uh, written in the last ten or fifteen pages of the book. I mention that only because uh, that later books have many more case studies. But anyway, that's, that's Watertown, divided, but somehow or another, by some miracle of God's providence, standing. <laughs> the way the book is organised is sort of half and half between Cambridge Cameos with its uh, simple case studies uh, running chronologically, and the more conventional divided we stand uh, kind of uh, textbooky kind of, of uh, town history in the case of Charlestown I have divided it up into eight sections um, and they, the, the first one is about the peopling of the town especially the origins of the people who arrived then there's one about the, gov the town government which includes this huge list of people who held office in the town every year. Uh, there's a, a, sh a shortish piece about land, and the longest section by far is about the sea. Then there is a section on the church, quite a long section on women, uh, a, a rather sadly long section on violence, and then there, the last section is about defiance. And then there I have uh, um, many favourites within these sections, but what I have done is to sort out uh, 47 case studies and fit them into these individual sections. So, for instance, I've got, I found in the Massachusetts archives, a 25-page set of accounts that were prepared for uh, a godly sea captain called Thomas Jenner who sailed uh, was part owner and sailed for two Barbadian merchants one of whom was a large plantation owner and the other of whom was a, a very wealthy merchant 
in Barbados. And um, Jenner sailed on five voyages during a period of, uh, of about seven years. Um, they were almost all of them transatlantic voyages. And the detail which these accounts go into is simply staggering. Every piece of equipment that had to be bought, uh, every piece of maintenance that had to be done on the ship, every penny of pay that was issued to the seamen, uh, every uh, piece of uh, cargo that was carried on board, all of these things are noted in, in the general accounts. And uh, from quite early days, the 16, late 1630s, they had decided that the fairest thing to do was to stint the common. The, the word stint means ration. And you had, uh, depending often on your wealth and land holding, so many cow commons. So uh, some wealthy man uh, might have ten cow commons. He could graze ten cows on the common. Or alternatives, eight cows and four sheep, or uh, 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 geese, or goats, or, uh, but they were, the common was rationed. But it was still a common, and artisans uh, could use the um, common land for getting special types of wood. Uh, for instance, the wheelwrights uh, would get uh, ash wood and other good uh, woods for wheel, wheel building, and so on and so forth. The uh, stonemasons could quarry in certain places. It was a common. In, 16, uh, in the 1680s, there was a move in, I think, 1684, to privatize the cow common. In other words, to break it up into individual portions, fence it off, uh, and you would get the proportion of land that your number of cow commons uh, uh, afforded you. Well, there were quite a lot of people in town who didn't have cow commons, especially of the younger generation. And there were a lot of uh, artisans in town who had come to rely enormously on the common for their, uh, for their materials. And so, as a result of this, there was one hell of a hullabaloo. And uh, there was effectively a kind of, it was to, referred to as a tumult, uh, which means a rabble who went out onto the common and ceremonially started cutting down other people's trees as an act of, of real... Uh, uh, of rebellion and uh, I've just got a little piece to read uh, one of the leaders of this group was especially vocal and this is what he said before he would lose his interest in the common he had no cow commons but he was an artisan he would spend his house and land and tack wife and children which means put them out to some other family and show the select men uh, and go to England to the king that now is and say good king James have mercy upon thy poor subjects that have been in exile as you have and if you will hang me I will die like a man rather than be gnawn to pieces by a crew of rats <laughs> He said, he added several other unrecorded threatening words. <laughs> so there was, there was a real set to over the, uh, the cow common, which was never actually...